Kendrick Shope Show. Woo-hoo! Woo! Oh, man. Kendrick Shope Show is leading the way in Lawn Line Entertainment. And today it is messy, but we are here. You may have noticed, ladies and gentlemen, that we have moved locations. For those of you who don't know, look at that. Look at that background. Oh, my gosh. It's so dang dark. We are waiting on our house to be done here in Bentonville, Arkansas. And so we are in a hotel for 30 days and we had to move from one hotel to another because of just circumstances. And so everything's darker in this hotel. Everything looks a little bit different. This is not the permanent home of the Kendrick Show Show, but it is the temporary home. So welcome. Happy Monday. I hope you had a good weekend. I am so flipping excited for today's guest, Bailey Hancock. Did I say your last name right, Bailey? You did. Just Bailey like John. Hancock from LA, not from LA, but she's in LA. And that we had a little joke before we started the show. For those of you in the South, you will get this. Not lower Alabama. She's in the actual LA, Los Angeles. Welcome to the Kendrick Show Show, Bailey. I'm so excited to be here. So excited. How long have you been in LA? I just hit my seven year anniversary. And wow. so, yeah, on uh, December 30th, 2010, I made the trek from Florida to not lower Alabama to the real Los Angeles and real haven't, Los Angeles. haven't looked back ever since. I love it. I love it. I love it. And, you know, it. Um, we usually start this show off with a an epic mom failure of the day. And we have people tweet us their epic mom failures. And, but you know what? I'm just going to start the show out with just a failure <laughs> today. I have, I don't know if I went to bed too early last night. I don't know if I went to bed too late. I don't know if I had one too many glasses of wine. I don't know if I didn't have not enough not. wine, but I'm just half a second off. I mean, technology's not working for me. I'm in a pissy mood audience. Do y'all ever just, I mean, I just want to like claw things. It's just not my morning today. Ugh. We're going to so. change that. We're going to get this day on a good note by the end we of this talk. Are. We are, we are. Um, and so uh, I guess instead of an epic mom failure moment of the day, we'll talk about just an epic human being moment failure. I am just off. And, you know, I think it's okay. I think one of the things oh, yeah. that that we don't do enough of is, is, is honest about how we feel. So I'm having one of those days, people. <laughs> if, if, if you understand, tweet me. Tweet me and say, I feel you. You're not alone. All right. All right. Well, we're going to jump straight in with Bailey Hancock in not lower Alabama in Los <laughs> Angeles. Bailey, welcome to the show again. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do, Bailey? Oh, gosh, that's a question that rattles my brain pretty frequently. But um, I call myself a multi-passionate entrepreneur because I'm one of those people that does more than just one thing. But my two main things that I do is I'm a collaboration consultant and I work with ambitious women to help them leverage their communities to grow their business. And I'm a career happiness strategist who also works with ambitious women to help them figure out what their next career move should be, make career changes, all of that good stuff. So I guess my through line is that I'm definitely one of those hyper connector people that always finds ways to work with the people in my network, in my community, in collaborative ways so that we can all kind of do fun stuff together. Fantastic. And so Bailey is our first ever guest on Boss Lady Mondays. <gasps> Boss so Lady Monday. Love saying that. Boss Lady. Oh yeah. Boss Lady. Oh yeah. We have given each day a each day a segment name. So Boss Lady Monday is where we have just just what it says. Boss ladies, people in charge, people who are excellent, outstanding, so that our community can learn from them. Tuesdays, tell it like it is Tuesday, where I answer questions about how to grow your business. Wednesday is Celebrate Women Wednesday, where we have just yeah. an, an uplifting story about Wednesday. Thursday is Kendrick's Countdown, the top three things you need to do this week to grow your business. And Friday is Freebie Friday, which is where I coach somebody free and give something away for free. So welcome to being the first ever Boss Lady Monday. I can't even tell you how perfectly aligned that is. I One of my groups that I attribute most of my success to is the boss ladies community. It's actually a quarter or a twice a year magazine that features just women doing amazing things with business and personal and all of that. So I'm in a boss ladies community. And then I have this goal group that I'm a part of and we call ourselves the boss babes. So this is very on brand. I love it. <laughs> it very, very much is. So I want to dig right in Bailey to something that you said that really intrigued me because you use the word multi-passionate, right? And basically what multi-passionate says to me and what you articulated to us is I do a lot of different things. I'm not just niched in one area, right. which is a, a big question I get every year come sales school time. What if I don't want to do one thing? 
What if I want to do two things? What if I want to do three things? How do I speak to all those people? It's one of the reasons when you were recommended to me to be on the show, I was so excited to, to have you. So let's put this niching question to bed once and for all. Did you start with one single niche and branch out? Did you have multiple niches when you started? Tell us like it is. I've literally been this person since as long as I can remember. I was the kid growing up that was on dance team and the swim team. And I was president of this and I was editor of the yearbook. And I was, I was all of the things, right? I think sophomore year was my peak where I was involved in eight clubs or activities simultaneously and had a job at TGI Fridays. So I've always been the kind of <laughs> person that just, you know, wanted to have my hands in a lot of stuff because it's not that I get bored easily. It's that I'm insatiably curious. And so a lot of things pique my interest. And so as I got older, I definitely fell into that trap of, well, you got to pick something. You can't just do all the things. So I started my career in event management and I did that for a good long while, got my MBA. And when I made that trip out to Los Angeles seven years ago, that's when I kind of pressed pause on my life and, and reassessed the situation. And fast forward now seven years um, to answer your question, I guess I've always had trouble with that answer of like, well, don't you need to specify? Don't you need to pick one thing? Because you can't be everything to everybody. And I, I do find that to be a big challenge in my life. So I'm excited to hear what you don't really tell people on that. But for me, I think what value I bring to my clients, whether they're individuals who are moving their, through their careers or they're entrepreneurs, is that ability to weave through my various interests and curiosities um, and help them understand how they can really leverage their own too. I'm not a proponent of being multiple things. I think having a lot of titles is really tricky for sales and for business specifically. I was just at a branding workshop this weekend and I spent all five, no, seven hours of it racking my brain. Like, do I need one title? Do I go with both? Do I go with something very broad, like multi-passionate entrepreneur, which means nothing to anybody. So I struggle with this, but for me, I've made it work in that some people know me as one thing. Some people know me as other and God bless them. My friends and family know me as the woman that who know who the hell knows what she's going to be up to next. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, and it's interesting. You're, you're a great, you're a great person to have on after our free coaching Friday, because we had a person who was talking about, I'm, I'm niched in one area and I want to do something totally different. How do I, how do I bring the two together? And one of the things I always tell people is, can you marry the two? Are there common threads that, you know, make it, make it easy enough to marry. And, mm -hmm. and if not, then maybe we need to speak to two people. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of niching. I, that's the way I did my business. I see a lot of really successful businesses, um, I always reference Anastasia Browse, you know, in Beverly Hills, oh, yeah. they started with Browse and then they branched out to now um, eye makeup. However, just because I'm a big component of it, and it's one of the things that I love about, about this show is being able to highlight just because I say do it doesn't mean that there, and this is improper grammar, isn't another way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a friend, Susan Hyatt, who wears all different hats, you know, weight coaching, life coaching, uh, everything, now business coaching. And so it is possible. And that's what I want our viewers to see is just because an expert says this is the way to do it. You've got to make it fit for you. And if you just can't make that dress of niching or that shoe that says you got a niche fit, then you got to be true to you first. And so I think that you've yeah. really done that, Bailey. Yeah. And, you know, I go back and forth a lot because I think there is power in owning your various interests and your various strengths and all of that. Um, but I'm also, I mean, I have an MBA where they drill into your mind, like with marketing, you can't be everything to everybody. You can't, your target customer isn't everybody. Even if you're Apple, it's not everybody. So it's something I'm still toying with. This weekend I came up with, all right, maybe I'm a career and business strategist, which again, kind of doesn't say anything. So it's a forever challenge. Don't you but honestly, screw it. <laughs> Don't you love how, and, I, and, I, and I've done this many times too, but how we rack our brains over what is it? What do we call ourselves? What is it? And then you come up with the, this name and you're like, you're smart enough to know what the hell does that mean? It means nothing, about? right? <laughs> right. I should speak a lot louder than words anyway. So let's get to actions. Let's say, Bailey, that someone is miserable in their career. They, the alarm goes off. They want to throw the pillow over their head. They think, can I be End sick? All. Yeah. Can, can, <laughs> can, can, can a brick fall out of the, the heavens and knock me out? Not kill me, just injure me so I don't have to go to work. 
What advice would you give those people? Yeah, this unfortunately describes a lot of people. Um, And the thing that I always say, my go-to tagline is life is too short to hate your job. You know, we have 40 plus years of work. You've got to at least not hate it, right? And I've recently been coming back to this philosophy of, you know, we're not guaranteed a ton of time here on this earth that we find ourselves on. Um, And when we're gone, we have to assume nobody's going to remember us. And although that feels pessimistic at first, I've been able to flip it in my mind as the most optimistic, empowering thing that I can think of. Because if I sit down and think, okay, I've got, you know, maybe if I'm lucky 80 something years here, I'm going to make the most of this trip. You know, if you picture like coming to earth as like a vacation, it's like, what are my must do's? What are my must sees? What restaurants do I need to eat at? For me, I know that while I'm here, I want to make an impact. I want to help people. And I don't care if nobody remembers me when I'm gone, but I want to get the most out of this. So I say that because the people that are sitting in jobs and just plugging away day after day, because that's just the way life is, I would implore you to think differently because that is not just the way that life is. Life should be an adventure. It should be something that you really get the most out of. I like to say that life is like, a buffet. And when I'm done, when I die, I want to have my face plastered on a sign that says, do not serve this girl because I ate too much. I like went up too many times and got too many plates and just was sick off eating so much food. That's how I like to treat my life. And that might feel very extreme. And this probably speaks to the multi-passionate within me. That's like, I want it all. (laughs) You can't very well be and pizza and crab legs all on the same plate. It's not going to taste good. But to the people that are stuck in jobs that they hate, they often use that word stuck and you're not whether you want to be or not, like nothing is forever good or bad. So go with that. So the first thing to think about is, well, what do I hate so much about this? What's making me so unhappy? And you might find it's a lot more simple than you're making it out to be. It could be that you just really don't like your coworkers. Maybe you even hate your desk. I had a job once that my le- my desk was lime green and it made me want to just scratch my eyes, eyeballs out every single day. So see what it is that's actually causing the trouble And see if you can turn the volume down on that and turn the volume up on the things about it that you actually like. And that's just a good place to start. So you highlight a couple of things there that I'd I'd love to dig into. One one of the things is, uh, you know, it can be something as simple as your desk, right? Like in this moment, if I had to do this every day in this dark area, I would, I'd go nuts. Right. And And you love what you do, I assume. So it's just a circumstantial thing. Yeah. But, but it's interesting because six years, 10 years ago, I probably would have talked myself out of that. I probably would have said that's stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Like, can't you just hear everybody at their job saying that's stupid? Why it's is not this that thing simple. beeping and beeping? That's stupid. <laughs> it's not that simple. That's selfish. That's shallow. It's just a desk. And really, maybe it is just a desk. And so for anybody watching, you know, if you hate that lamp at your desk, if you hate your lime green desk, by God, let's go fix it. Whatever we got to do, that's an easy fix. Right. But Curious. I want to play devil's advocate for a minute. So for somebody in a job, hates their job, brick, praying for bricks to hit them, not kill them, just seriously injure them. So they still get paid. They still have fun. But you know. um, And they hear you talking. What about, I would imagine this is, this is, this is something you would hear a lot, which is, yeah, but I can't afford not to have this job. I need money. I have bills to pay. I have a family. I don't have the luxury of being 20, whatever years old and going out and finding myself. My time has passed. What would you say to that? Yeah. Well, first of all, your time has definitely not passed. Um, people, you know, I even hear like late 20 something say, well, it's too late to make a change. I've already done this for five years. I'm like, what about those other 35 that you've got in head of you? You know, that's crazy. And yes, you are correct. Like I'm not by any means suggesting that anybody just say, screw it, flip their desk and walk out. I think it's about incremental changes. It's about being realistic with yourself, your expectations, where you actually see yourself wanting to go and deciding, am I willing to cross the distance between where I am today and where I want to be, however long in the future. And you know, you should never leave your job. I'm a huge anti leap and the net will appear motto person. I think that is horrible advice. I am all about the strategy. My whole philosophy is make big moves with small steps. And so, yes, you, you have bills to pay. You've got mouths to feed. You want to sleep inside and eat regularly. I am with you there. However, that job that you have that's paying you however much is not the only one in the world. And I guarantee you, you know, if you work with a recruiter or you work with a career coach or somebody like that, and you identify 
listen, I need to be making minimum this much a year. They're going to be able to provide you with opportunities that are still at that level. Now it might not be the most exciting job in the world, but like if you get a little bit closer to what you realize will actually make you happy in a job, then that kind of doesn't matter. So it's more about being realistic, figuring out what do I actually need to change? And if it's, you know, you don't vibe with the company culture or you're stagnant in your role, there's no growth opportunities. Those are all the things I hear most, by the way, then fine, find a company where you can make a lateral move, same job function, same salary, but maybe a different environment that's going to make you happier. And then there's no harm, no foul. And you just keep repeating that process till you get closer and closer to something that actually makes you excited and not wishing for bricks every morning. Okay, so what about, and this brings in sort of the other piece, I think, or part of the other piece of what you do, is it the career or is it the person? Does that make sense? So, no. so when I hated my job, which I, I hate maybe too strong of a word, but when I when the, I have has certainly been in jobs where I was like, I just don't want to go. I'd hide under the, I didn't, I didn't. I would metaphorically hide under the desk. I really did hide under my desk one time and listen to a meditation app because I was about to lose my damn mind. Well, there you so. go. There you go. Um, <laughs> the problem wasn't necessarily the job. Oh, I yeah. made the job the villain, but it was, it was, I always throughout my life have had a villain. It's always been we all do. The, the move, the city, the job, this job, the not having enough money because I started my own business. Like it's like this own life to coaching tool I've created on my own, identify your villain and then, and then blah, 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 blah. So is it the person or is it the job? You know, Kendrick, I'm glad you said this because this is something that comes up a lot too. Um, whenever I force people to do kind of their career timeline where they look back at every role they've ever had, I have them identify like what, what made you take that job in the first place? And then why did you quit that job? And if your why you quit that job is the same over and over and over again, that's usually a pretty good indication that it's you and that's okay. Like people start to get really like, oh shit, well, if it's me, then uh, uh, I'm stuck with me forever. But we all have the capacity to evolve and change. And I think the sooner you identify that it's something that's coming from within that you can actually fix, the better off you'll be. And we also do this thing where sometimes when we aren't happy in our personal lives, we also aren't happy in our professional lives and vice yeah. versa. I mean, the time when I hated my professional situation the most, I was dating a really crappy guy that made me feel really insecure and I lacked all confidence. And so at work, it bled through. And when I got rid of the guy, the job went away and I moved into a new direction. I was like, oh, I was kind of, this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so I was able to realize like confidence is a huge piece for me. And if I'm not feeling confident in my personal life, that's going to bleed through to work. So it's sometimes, I mean, usually it's one or the other. I don't think it's always you or always the career, but that's the piece that's most important to identify before you make any moves. And how do you identify that? So like if you, if you use you as an example, mm -hmm. so something's going on really crappy in your personal life, it's bleeding over into other areas of your life. But, but you know, this as well as anybody, when you're in that situation, it's so yeah. difficult. To see. It's like when your girlfriend's dating the jerk and everybody can see it, but she can't, she thinks yeah. he's the best thing that's life spread. So, you know, something's off, you know, you're hurting, but what do you do? How do you identify what the problem is? Yeah, I think it's having those tough conversations with yourself and really sitting down and, and walking through moment by moment of your average day and identifying like, what are the pieces that give me anxiety about this? Or where does the pit in my stomach come from when I think about it? And for me, when I really thought about it, because during that phase of my life, I was waiting tables and bartending and had multiple gigs day and night and had an MBA. And so there was a lot going on in here and a lot of self-confidence issues and all of that. And when I really sat and thought about it, like, okay, wake up, put on my ugly, you know, olive green vest and suit up in my black tie and go serve seafood, you know, yeah, that's not fulfilling, but like, that's not so bad. I'm staring out at the ocean while I do it. I meet interesting people. Okay. And you keep walking through your day and you're like, what about when I go to the night job? Yeah, that sucks that I can't go home and relax. But you know, in all reality, I'm making good money. I'm not doing that hard of work. Okay. And then you're like, when I go home and then the pit shows up and you're like, oh, that's when I start to feel anxious and I start to feel ick about my life. So, you know, it's not an overnight thing and it's not a sit down and do a five minute exercise kind of thing. But that's where I think really like being honest with yourself and giving your space, yourself space to think. And I mean, I'm a big proponent of journaling just to get whatever's in here out on papers that I can say, 
oh, I didn't know I thought that. Interesting. What do I do with this knowledge? So, so for somebody who's made the New Year's resolution, it's January, right? Somebody who's made the New Year's resolution to start journaling. Mm. What? So, and this sounds like this is such a, uh, Hank Norman would say, you're so freaking left brain. Just try it. But give me a step. What do I journal about? Do I just journal anything I think? And then and do I journal my dreams? Do I journal my hopes? Do I journal everything I hate about myself? I mean, I, what do you journal? So it's totally personal, but I'll tell you what I do. So every morning, and I've actually been on this, I think I'm 18 days straight. This will be day 19 of having, giving myself 20 minutes every morning to, it's kind of part meditating part, honestly, just sitting there with yourself. We're so distracted by our phones and by our laptops and all of that, that it's amazing when you put it in another room or I use mine cause I'll play, um, I use the meditation app insight. It's mm-hmm. fantastic because you can do guided, you can do just noises. I do like morning nature sounds so like a Creek and birds. And I just pretend that I'm in a mountain cabin somewhere. Um, and so despite the leaf blowers, like always outside of my window and like people listening to music too loud anyway. So for me, I give myself that 20 minutes to just sit there and If nothing comes up, cool, fine. I'm just like alone with myself for 20 minutes. Some days though, these thoughts just come running through where it's like images of people that I haven't thought of in a while that I should reach out to. Business ideas come up. My brain will start working through problems that I haven't figured out the solution to yet. So for me, that's part of it. And then when I'm done with that 20 minutes, I'll just open my journal up and I write AM thoughts at the top. And sometimes a couple bullet points come out. Sometimes I literally write, nope, nothing today. Other days, it's like 10 pages. And the other thing I do that isn't just the morning routine, when I'm feeling anxious or like I don't have the answer to something, and this is where the career stuff comes in a lot of times, I'll sit down and write in my notebook, what is stressing me out? And I'll just make bullet points. Well, this I can't stop thinking about. I don't have the answer to this. And then I'll take myself out of it like I'm my own friend. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, Bailey, just relax. We've got this. And I'll like write the answers to those problems. And it's shocking how often I've got a good answer for it. It's just the, you know, the stressed out worried me was so loud and the calm rational me was like patiently waiting her turn to get a word in. So that's yeah. how I journal. I don't make it all fluffy and woo woo, but you know, to each their own, if they do, I just think it's important to be able to see on paper what's going on in here. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. We started, uh, Hallie Anna started journaling this year because we were moving and, um, it, it, we've gotten a little, it's a little bit out of the habit because we moved again, but uh, it's, it's something that I find very helpful for both of us, especially because I've never been a big journaler. I remember, gosh, 12 years ago, I had a doctor who was flying into Atlanta for a speech. I had flown him in to speak to my doctors and he talked about, um, you were in my journal last night. I wrote about meeting you and whatever. And I remember thinking, God, what the heck would I journal about? Now I've learned a lot since then. And I, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, and it's interesting to me to be teaching my, my nine-year-old to do something that I've never really done. We're sort of learning it together. It's a it's an interesting practice. Yeah. I think starting it young too, especially at that age when you're getting all these things coming at you and you don't necessarily know how to handle them yeah. and you don't know how you think about them yet. And you know, spoiler alert guys, it never stops. <laughs> I'm a 33 year old woman and I feel sometimes equally as confused as my nine year old self. So journaling just helps take you out of the way and just lets the true thoughts come through so you can be objective about it. So one more thing I wanted to to, to, talk, to touch on, and you, you talked about this earlier, we've sort of jumped around, but you talked about the pit in your stomach. Mm-hmm. So sort of doing this inventory of your life, right? Like uh, this is when I go to my job, I may hate it, but actually it's not that bad. I get to look at the ocean or I get to whatever. I get to dress up in high heels. That's what I would have said. There you go. Or, um, I, you know, I do this and yeah, it's not perfect, but there's some positive. Oh God, but I go home and there's this guy and it's miserable. I'm you didn't say this. I'm just using an example and you get this pit in your stomach. So does the pit in your stomach, we, you all know what we're talking about when you know something's wrong, but you, you, you've gotten so busy and so tuned out that we don't pay attention to it. That really is the first sign of where something's really wrong. Is that for, accurate? For me, it is. For me, it's my gut. And when it manifests itself into a physical feeling, that's when I know I've been ignoring it. And I don't get them very often anymore because I'm far more communicative with myself. And I listen to those subtle signs, you know, it'll keep coming at you until you hear it loud and clear. And for some people I have 
women in my life who I know who have given themselves ulcers because they've just shoved that stress down over and over and over and just ignored it until their bodies were like, Hey, guess what? Can't ignore me hospital now. And so I, I don't ever recommend neglecting your core instincts and your gut for that long because it will get you eventually. But for me, when I actually get that pit and I'm like, Oh, this doesn't feel good. Like you get that weight on your chest. I can just feel it being recreated. Just even thinking of like the other job that I had that when I drove into the parking garage every morning, I like started kind of getting a panic attack and that it just went on way too long. What about people who say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like they're so disconnected from here down that they're like, Pit, I don't know what you're talking about. I just hate my job. Like, or I just, I just, I'm crying on my pillow every night and I don't know why. So, so let's take it even one step further. Fantastic. If you are still connected enough to your body that you can feel that gut feeling great. Mm -hmm. That sort of acts as your North star to pay attention. Something's wrong. Something might need to be changed, but what if you don't get that? What are some other signs and symptoms that, Hey, you might want to pay attention. Your body's talking to you. The universe is talking to you. We're talking about worst case scenario. They're gone. They do not feel their body. How do they start? I think everybody's got indicators and it's a matter of paying attention to what's not normal for you and what's happening more frequently. So for a lot of people, it could be, they're finding themselves, you know, not wanting to do anything at night around the weekends. They don't even want to see their friends. They don't want to leave the house. They're going in these deep, dark Netflix binges. Um, For some people it's going out too much for, you know, it can be like always needing to go to happy hour after work and then not really wanting to go home after happy hour It can be losing yourself in work. Um, I think anything that pops up that you're like, oh, well, I didn't used to do this all the time. You know, I think it's helpful to think about a moment in your life or a phase of your life where you were really happy and fulfilled and think, was I doing this thing? Was this behavior showing up back then? And I think it's hard because it is personal and it is individual. But once you figure out what your, your thing is, your indicator is, it becomes a hell of a lot easier to pay attention to it going forward. So again, it's giving yourself that yeah. time to think. I am. Um, so confession time for the audience. When we moved to Greenville, this is not a confession, but stick with me. Uh, we just weren't happy. Greenville is a lovely city. I say it's like the perfect black dress hanging in your closet that you buy and you're so excited to wear. And my, Bailey, I, my husband was promoted. We moved from Arkansas to Greenville, South Carolina. It was our fourth move. So we've done the moving thing before. Um, closer to home, but it's like this perfect dress in your closet and you put it on. It just doesn't fit. Looks great on your best friend. And you're like, why doesn't it look like that on me? It just didn't fit us. But Hallianna, our daughter, was crying every night, mm-hmm. missing her friends. Uh, every night we were there for six, seven, eight months. She cried every night and I would get her off to school in the morning, walked her to school. And then I would come back and I would, you know, supposed to start work and I would sit on the couch every day and I binged watched the good wife. Now I've already seen the good wife. (laughs) So So I binged watched something I had seen already and I was in my sweats and we would have milk and cookie night every night and we would eat pizza all the time. And finally, I mean, I just shut everything out. Like, and I, and I thought that what's tricky about this was I thought I was taking care of me. I thought, okay, Hallie has gone to school. Now we're just going to shut the world out for a few minutes, zone out. But what ended up happening was I just went further and further down and I realized I need human interaction. Like people need air. I am that much of an extrovert. I need, even outside of this, I need to get up. I need to get dressed. I need to not put on my tennis shoes. I need my heels on and my dress and my makeup because that's who I am. I need to go out and talk to people. And it's so funny. I mean, I I did that whole good wife spiel thing for three months probably. And I just felt worse and worse and worse. And finally I was like, okay, God, universe, Buddha, whoever, what is going on? I'm trying all these things. I'm trying to love on myself. I'm trying to shut the world out. Mm-mm, I needed the world, but it wasn't, you know, it, it was, it was really disguised as trying, as, as trying to follow experts advice and they don't say eat pizza all the time, but you know, um, you can take some liberties. Yeah. And so I, I, I bet that pit in my stomach was one of the things, you know, I just felt worse and worse and worse every day. And so, you know, what I can tell you all, if you're, if you're, if you're watching and you're like, I, I, I don't know, I'm not happy. You know, if you're happy, like you may not feel the gut feeling, 
you may not be going to the bar. You may not be good wife in it and pizza and cookie in it. But you know, if you're not happy, yeah. you know. And if you don't, you need to sit down and get quiet and figure it out. Because like Bailey said, we, we, got, we got limited time here, y'all. Limited time. Do you want to spend it not happy if you don't have to? Right? Got God, no. That is no and way to live life. No way to live life. No way to live life. So Bailey, what, what closing piece of advice would you give anybody watching who says, all right, I'm, I'm going to admit it to myself. If to nobody else, I'm not happy. I'm, they're going to sit down. They're going to do sort of this life inventory thing to sort of figure out where the amount of least happiness is. And then what, what's the next step? Yeah. The next step is kind of setting your sights on what you would rather be doing. So I often have people sit down and, and close their eyes and really think about a best case scenario day in the life of their life. Mm -hmm. And as it relates to work. So from wake up to bedtime, like how are you spending your days where it would actually make you feel really good? And for some people, it's very simple. It's having coworkers that they get along with and, and really enjoy, which is such an undervalued thing. Like having coworkers that you love makes all the difference in the world. And unfortunately, that's something really hard to identify before you're actually there, unless you know somebody on the inside already. Um, yeah. But I think sitting down and really thinking about, okay, well, you know, what are the pieces that are making me unhappy? What's the opposite of that? You know, if I hate my lime green desk, fine. What kind of desk do I want? If I'm not feeling fulfilled at work, what would fulfillment feel like? What would happiness in my day-to-day -day feel like? And you do have to kind of get specific because if we set our sights on these big overarching macro, like I just want to be happy. That's, we need details as human beings. We need details to latch onto and work towards. So I'd say go big and then go really small and get specific. So if you realize like, I got to get out of this job, I can't do accounting anymore. I've got to switch gears. Cool. This is an exciting piece. You get to now decide, fine, what's the next step? And once you have that next step in mind, you start working backwards from there. And the three things I always tell people when they're going to make a big move, the three small steps are. What do you need to do? So do you need more experience? Do you just need to put in the time? What do you need to learn? So do you need to go back to school? Do you need to get a certification? Whatever it is. And who do you need to connect with to be able to get intros at, at new companies and new industries, to get informational interviews, to have coffee with people, to get an in at a company that you don't know anybody at. So do learn and connect. What are those three things? And then that's when you can actually start saying, okay, fine. I need to get six months of experience before anybody will even look at my resume. How do you do it? Start taking steps, start taking actionable steps towards being able to say, okay, yeah, I've put in the work. Now I'm ready to make that move. And I think a lot of people get overwhelmed with that. I, the idea of that process, but I'm telling you when you don't like your life, the moment you start stepping in the direction of what you think is going to make you happy you get energized and you get reinvigorated for your days. And you start to say like, yeah, I'm not there yet, but I'm one step closer than I was yesterday. And I'm telling you, every time I've done this in my life, I've gotten this renewed sense of excitement for my days. And it just feels fun to be like on this road trip towards this destination that you're hoping works out. Maybe it won't the way you think, but that's okay. That's part of the process. So make a plan, make actionable steps and just start eating that elephant one bite at a time. I love it. And that's such a that's such great advice for our business, our, our, our boss ladies who own business as well, right? What do you need to do? I say this all the time. What do you need to do? What do you need to learn? And I don't say who do you need to connect with, but it's a great third piece. That's and a and big it's, piece. It's, it's a huge, it may be the biggest piece. Yeah. I think too, one other thing I want to add to that is for anyone who's like me, who's sitting there saying, okay, great. I hate my job, but here's what I want to do. I want to be on TV every day because that would have been what I would have said seven years ago, eight years ago. I want to be on TV every day. And that ship has sailed. It's but not you are. Look at the redhead. That's what I was going to say. Trust. I would have said the same thing. I would have told myself all those lies. And look, what has has happened in the last, you know, six years. I've been on television. We're, we're going to we're going to get this show on television. Ooh. So if if a hick from Tennessee said with love can do this. Y'all got no excuse. Hey, so, I'm, a so girl, just, I'm, a, I'm a girl from a 15,000 person town in Florida. And same thing. When I moved to LA, I wanted to be a TV show host. Got out here and was like, Ugh, just kidding. I don't want to do this. Seven years later, I've got a <laughs> podcast. We've recorded the same way that we're recording right now. And my friends from back home, 
when it started coming out, they were texting me and they're like, Bailey, you're doing it. You're doing it. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. I am. And it just, yeah, it doesn't always shake out the I, way yeah. it's going to, but that's the fun in it. It is. And it's the same thing that happened with this show. You know, when I, when I was sat down with our, our media team, who you know, Bailey as well. And I said, they said, you know, what do you want? I said, I want my own daytime talk show. And they were like, great. Here's, so what do you want to do? Okay. Here, and then they gave me the steps and, it, and, and this right here is about learning and that's what we're doing here. Right. And then who do you need to connect with? And they're helping with that. So, I mean, it's kind of the formula for a lot of things that you do in business and in Everything. life. What do you need to do? What do you need to learn? Who do you need to connect with? Just Write start it down. There. Start, there. start there. That is yeah. it. Fantastic. So Bailey, uh, two things. If people want to connect with you, what's the best, best, best way to do that? So across all social channels, I'm at Bailey with no E. So B-A-I-L-Y Hancock, H-A-N-C-O-C-K, like John. Um, probably the best way is to go to my website, baileyhancock.com. All of my various multi-passionate options are there. I just launched a podcast at the beginning of January. So it's called The Bailey Hancock Show. I make it very simple to find me. That's why um, it should be. Good yeah. sales tool right there. Yeah. And so I would love to connect with your community. I have a feeling they're a bunch of badass women and those are my favorite kind of people. So it they are a bunch, of, a bunch of badass boss ladies. So the last thing we do on the Kidrick Shope Show is we shift gears into kind of what do you want to do? What do you want to learn? A, a step. So every day we talk about a step that we are taking towards our big dream, our big goal for 2018. Mine is get this show picked up. And so my step audience was I had a meeting this morning with my media team and they ripped me over the coals <gasps> and it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun, but they were like, we hate this. We hate this. We love this. We love this. Do more of this. And so that was my big unpleasant step that needed to happen because I'm in the learning phase. And if somebody doesn't tell you, we hate this, we hate this, we love this, we love this, you're never going to know. So that's my big step. I had this really uncomfortable conversation that I didn't want to have, but I did want to have. That's my big step towards getting this show picked up. How about you, Bailey? You got a big dream you want to share with us and a step you're taking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my big dream forever, but it's been actually worked on the last two years has been make my career as a professional speaker and get to travel the globe, empowering, motivating, and giving people strategies to help love their lives. And so for me, those, that's the big step, the small steps, get my podcast, like going, get on a top 10 list of some kind. I have no idea how to do that, but I'm working on it. Um, teach workshops locally, get speaking gigs. My gig, my deal is, uh, 18 in 2018. So 18 speaking gigs this year. I did 17 and 17 last year actually hit 20 last year. So my secret goal is like 25 this year, but just doing it, you know, not saying no to opportunities, taking things yeah. as they come. It's the thing that lights me up the most in life. And so, yeah, and I'm not always hundred percent comfortable doing it, but when I finish doing a talk, it's like, I have to imagine what it must be like to be on crazy drugs. Cause I'm just my fuel, my adrenaline's pumping. I'm so happy. I'm like on cloud nine. And then of course I crash and I need like a big nap, but it's the thing that I want the most in life. So it's doing things like this, being on your show and being able to say hello to your community and letting them know that, hey, you, you need a gal to come talk about career happiness and collaboration. I got your girl. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I will say, um, I have I have a similar feeling. Mine actually happens right before I go on stage. I, I, I say the minute my high heel touches the stage, I'm in a bubble. Yeah. And it is like, I feel the safest, except when I'm holding Helliana, the safest of any place in the world, which is a really cool thing. Cause you know, public speaking, one of the number one fears, if it's not still the number one fear. And so I, I love that you shared that. And I got a feeling that uh, you're going to surpass your 25, forget 18 I and 18. So. We should do one I together. Gotta, I feel like we can uh, have oh, a Kendrick and Bailey show. <laughs> let's do it. I'm not sure. You know, I had, I interviewed, um, I think I was talking to Marie the other day and the internet did this wonky thing. And I said, it's just too much energy all at once. The internet can't handle all this energy. So that's fair. Maybe really, we should tag team it. We each speak at different times. So we don't like knock out the lights. You know what? Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's take Steve. About world, that tour. Say, world tour. <laughs> world tour. We're taking over the world, baby. Woo. And so can you, Damn I right. believe in you. I believe in your business. I believe in your ability to create anything you want in life. After all, as Bailey Hancock says, 